You will achieve things in life. And that's what I do. I know what I'm going to do. I know that I'm better than this Sounds guy. Like I know that I'm going to knock him out. You've ever read. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f up. Trash Talk Going Wrong has firmly cemented its place in the zeitgeist of the MMA community. Speak and you're going to get it on Sunday. <laughs> Seeing fighters be humbled or humiliated is not only satisfying, it almost feels deserved. Step in there with me. Ain't nothing to talk about. Ain't nothing to say. It's all right here and I'm on your ass. But what happens when it goes right? Is there something to be said for those who viciously and ruthlessly dismantle their opponents with merciless perceptions and eerie predictions of fates yet to come? Well in this video, we will explore the highlight reels of those who have talked the talk and ultimately walked the walk. A completion in cinematic form of those who have been humiliated, humbled, and dismantled by their opponents on the main stage and ultimately the octagon. And where best to start than Conor McGregor's ascension to stardom, his viral and enigmatic psychological destruction of the King of Rio, Jose Aldo. <laughs> Okay, Beverly. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Can we move the seat? Tell him I'm his daddy. Tell him I'm his daddy. I really don't care. I own this town. I own Rio de Janeiro. Next time you see me again. Next time you see me again. What are you looking at? What you wanna do? You wanna do something? You wanna do something? So what is it that, that he did that disrespected you, that got you to dislike him? This is not a therapy session. You like it? It looks good, right? Say goodbye. Otario, Otario! I own this town, yeah? I own Rio. Where's Jose? He's not even here. Where has he fled the country? In some mockery of reality, Conor McGregor just moments before one of the most shocking championship performances in the sport would practice the very shot that ended the fight 13 seconds in, visualising his intentions. McGregor, over the course of almost a year, had worn Jose down, verbally insulting and humiliating him at every opportunity. Jose had sat proudly on the featherweight throne for half a decade, his rule well respected, and his legitimacy never questioned. That was until an Irishman came out from the shadows to spoil his domination. McGregor had proclaimed he would end it in one, and rightfully left with the fastest finish in championship history, a record that stands to this day. Over the course of his rise, his words painted a tapestry of futures yet to be seen in rich and enigmatic detail. I felt when we stared down, I felt his right hand was twitching a little bit, but it was a subtle tell for me. He is ready to un unload that right hand, but I feel that could be a downfall for him. Mystic Mac was an artist of manifestation, and the octagon was his canvas for his visions to be realised. From his shot calling that would predict the inevitable destruction of Dustin Poirier's pea head to the mental ruination of Jose Aldo, McGregor, quite rightly, is a man that sits firmly at the top of any trash talk video. Connor had catapulted the UFC's popularity into the stratosphere with otherworldly effect. For all intents and purposes, there was an era where the UFC was McGregor. His name was on the tips of everyone's tongues, brought there by the rumblings and faint whispers of a charismatic Irishman, his sound bites viral, and his KOs awe-inspiring. At the height of his popularity, after not only claiming the featherweight title in emphatic fashion, but also redeeming himself in a Diaz rematch, McGregor was set to become the first ever simultaneous double champion, something we have now seen many times, but back in 2016, it was novel, it was history-defining, it was simply put, the greatest moment of combat sports ever, and I doubt that any of that would have come to fruition if it wasn't for his personality and his viral trash talk moments of which he had built an empire off of, his riches and notoriety eternalised in the history books. 
because that's what happens when trash talk goes right. You become immortalized in highlight reels and completions, your name etched into the cranium of fight fans for all the right reasons, and so now it's time to explore the history of trash talk in depth. So sit back and relax, and enjoy this feature length version of When Trash Talk Goes Right. Sorry, I was just having the best night's sleep ever, courtesy of today's video sponsor, Mantis Sleep. I've slept with a sleep mask for years, and as someone who works night shifts a few days every month, it's been super important to have something wrapped around my eyes. The problem with them is that one, they either don't block out the light and I get woken up by the midday sun, or I'll wake up and find that the mask is magically transported to the other side of the bedroom. The first issue is solved by Manta's eyepieces, which puts zero pressure on your eyes, but it also perfectly seals out any light. I mean, it's completely blacked out. The eyepieces are adjustable to your face, which just adds to the comfort of the mask and allows you to get a truly blacked out night's sleep. I mean, if you are Michael Bisping, you probably don't need the second one. The second feature that I absolutely love is just how comfortable they are on my face. I'm a side sleeper, so these angled pieces are perfect. But also, I don't know what voodoo mantis sleep are blessing these velcro bits with, but they are the strongest and most reliable mask I've worn, never falling off my face during the night. Using these masks over the last month, I've just had the best night's sleep, and there's no way I'm going back. Another great feature about these masks is the ability to machine wash them. You can tuck them away in this little bag and throw them in the washing machine and get rid of all your nighttime tears produced from watching Dustin fail another title shot. You can find all the different masks that are available to you by checking out Man to Sleep using the link in the description and pinned comment. Make sure that you use code ACADEMIC for 10% off your order. And thanks once again to Man to Sleep for sponsoring this video. The middleweight division would be changed irrevocably after Chris Weidman famously failed the elusive goat Anderson Silva. The showboating, in all its fan-inducing fervour, had finally caught up with him. Weidman, after dismissing claims of a fluke by defeating Anderson again, would cement his own name in the division's archives by going on to defend his title against legends such as Vitor Belfort and Lyota Machida. As the waning days of 2015 befell the MMA world, Luke Rockhold, the former Strikeforce middleweight champ, would later rest notions of Weidman being unstoppable by offering the undefeated champ's blood to Korn via TKO in the fourth round and claiming his precious bounty that coveted 10 pounds of gold and black leather. Weidman was still his father's boy though. And this is still my boy! Perhaps more importantly though, he was still Dana's boy, who granted Chris an immediate rematch to take place six months later at UFC 199. The MMA gods don't wistfully hand out rematches like it's naught though. Weidman would be pulled from the fight just 17 days before the event, meaning that a contender would have to step up on an extremely short notice to fight for the belt. No small task. But there was one man willing to put his money where his mouth is. After Jacques Ray had turned down the short notice matchup, British contender Michael Bisping would be the one to ultimately step up to the plate. Bisping, for those that didn't know, entered the UFC an undefeated talent, winning season 3 of The Ultimate Fighter. And despite being one of the best fighters Britain had ever produced, he was never quite able to find himself in a title fight, coming close but falling short in pivotal fights or title eliminator fights. Perhaps the most famous of which, Dan Henderson would spirit bomb his soul into the bleak and somber CTE-infused lands of eternal darkness, with a flying hammer fist so brutal it quite literally became Hendo's logo. In whatever fickle way destiny works, the one chance Michael had to fight for the thing that had eluded him for so long was provided on essentially two weeks short notice. And not only that, but against a guy who had already beaten him. I started seeing messages that, you know, Whiteman had pulled out and I was like, what? So I, I messaged Dana, I said, listen, if this is true, I'm in. Bisping is cut from a different cloth than most, however, and circumstance wasn't about to derail any hope that he had. Bisping was there to win, against every odd, and he was going to do it in the only way he knew how. Shit talk all the way until the octagon doors closed behind him. Luke Rockhold and Chris Weidman couldn't sell a fight. They couldn't sell water to a thirsty man in a desert. I can sell sand to an Arab. Let's welcome in the middleweight champion Luke Rockhold from the Bay Area and his new opponent, fourth ranked Michael Bisping via Skype in Canada. And I want to I congratu congratulate him on his retirement. Sounds like he's got a great, <laughs> uh, nice budding music, uh, movie career. So. I'm excited to, uh, to send him off into the sunset. Think you'll be hearing is me ringing bells around your head, son. I'm going to knock him out. He's going to be led on the floor. He's going to look up the stars and think, I'm going to knock you out every time we fight. 
Absolutely incorrect, my friend. Since me, you haven't fought a real fighter. Congrats, you got the job done on the night. You did, well done, and I take my hat off to you. I'm a real fighter, I'm a fighter's fighter. I'll fight anyone, any place, any time, and I will be victorious on Saturday night. It's his destiny, right? That's what he calls it. Yeah, it is, bud. It is. Is to be it, my... is. it is my destiny. You can't write this. It's your destiny to be my little... You've got nothing going on between your ears, buddy. I know what I'm going to do. I know that I'm better than this guy. Sounds like I the worst self-help book out. you've ever read. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Listen. I've wanted the rematch ever since. I haven't lost a fight since. I just beat the greatest of all time. Don't be so cocksure, buddy. The Listen, I'm taking you back. I'm going to knock that the look off your face. I'm going to knock that the look off your face, pal. Believe you me. What the fuck you fucking Two weeks now, it's boy. Two weeks fucking now, I'm going to step off the couch, drink your fucking beer, man. I'm going to smash your face in. Yeah. Smash your I'm gonna finish you in the yeah, yo, really? So you you can't just fuck off. Yeah. Look at you. You said that last time. You said that last time, motherfucker. Yeah, turn into a wrestler. Everybody, thank you. You turn into a fucking wrestler. Hey. Oh. 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 Luke Rockhold, Michael Bisping for the UFC middleweight championship of the world. Here we go. Never more confident. In one of the most captivating moments the sport would ever bear witness to, Left Hook Larry would secure a world championship belt on less than two weeks' notice. Bisping, a true underdog for the majority of his career, a legend, a UK pioneer, and a man whose roller coaster of a legacy told one singular story. Determination and hard work trumps all other methods of victory. His time orbiting the top echelon of the sport was always bittersweet coming within inches of gold, but always being knocked back to the starting line. His dream of lifting a world title above his head had begun to fade in the waning years of his lengthy and entertaining career. But for whatever reason, the universe had granted him this opportunity, and not only did he grip it with every fibre of his being, he conceived, he believed, and he achieved, ripping the lofty middleweight crown from Rockhold's perfect model career-worthy head and beat him into the shadow realm with it, manifesting into reality one of the most iconic and feel-good moments the sport would ever be blessed with. Rockhold had every single cringy, self-important word he'd ever spewed kicked back down his throat, and to make matters worse, was made to sit and watch whilst semi-unconscious Bisping rub it in his face, beer in hand, and laughing all the way. Dominic Cruz had spent the best part of his career beating up on, or down on if you will, members of Team Alpha Male, and it's fair to say when it comes to trash talk, there is perhaps no one better than Cruz himself. Dominic was a pioneer for bantamweights in the UFC, and if you were to rewind the clock back to October 2011, you would be a firm believer that by the end of his career, the Mount Rushmore of MMA would have his relief etched into the face of it. He was undefeated at bantamweight had captured the WEC title, defended it twice, and then subsequently promoted to UFC champion after the merger in 2010, and would go on to defend that title twice as well, once against Team Alpha Male gym owner Uriah Faber, and the other against MMA GOAT Demetrius Johnson, and right now man, doing something. But this reign of dominance would come to a screeching halt, not at the hands of an opponent inside of the cage, but rather catastrophic injury outside of it. The video is a little grainy. Did you in fact punch that man? Yeah, with, with, with what happens in, in, in... After tearing his ACL in the build-up to a highly anticipated rubber match with Uriah Faber, Dominic would be sidelined indefinitely. Now, what was your initial injury? Uh, ACL, MCL. What, what, what happened though? I was training while I was getting ready on the Ultimate Fighter back in 2012. 12 or 11 for Faber fight. We were getting ready to compete at the end of the show. And after a string of further injuries during his recovery, he would unfortunately be stripped of his belt due to the inactivity. During three long years of recovery, his belt would be passed between contenders, ultimately ending up around the waist of TJ Dillashaw. Upon his long-awaited return to the sport, Dom would have to earn his title shot by taking out a top contender, despite never losing the belt. Is it weird not being here with a belt though? It's been a while. The belt's just a piece of metal. I still got it in my heart. You still consider yourself the champion? I still consider myself one of the best on the planet. I believe that about myself. If you don't, you're going to get your butt kicked in that cage, man. You will. This would manifest in a matchup with Takeya Mizugaki, 
Unsurprisingly, there was a lot of doubt surrounding his return, but those whispers of uncertainty would be silenced in just one minute of competition. In one of the craziest comebacks this sport has ever seen, Don would knock out Mizugaki in spectacular fashion, signalling the return of the lineal champ. And so after years without a title fight, the majority of it spent injured, he would find himself granted permission to take on a man who had claimed the throne in his absence. The narrative going into the fight, unsurprisingly, was one of ring rust and one of age. I don't believe in, in, in the rust thing because as long as you prepare your body and challenge yourself and practice, uh, there, there shouldn't be rust there, you know? How I show up on Sunday night is me. Dom had lost the best years of his career on the sidelines, and returning to take on a champion after so long off was considered a fool's errand, despite how many people thought Dom was one of the greatest. And this was something the odd makers agreed with, Dominic coming in as the underdog. But for those who were listening, Dominic in those years had built a mentality carved from stone. He had gone to a place very few will in their lifetime, and returned with an unbreakable spirit. In that time away, he had also not lost that trash talk and wit that he was famous for, and so TJ was about to become a victim of some rather ruthless trash talk. Oh, he's just a talker, man. You know, he's just gonna try to organize this, this, cause I don't need to. Why? Cause I don't want to. I think you're scared to talk, talk because talk. you don't want to say what you're going to do because you're scared to eat your words. He doesn't face somebody like me. He's able to mix things up because he's facing stationary targets. So he's been able to look a lot better than he really is. I'm going to beat you because I'm better than you. I, nobody even hits me. All right, man, I'm done talking to you. You can't be done talking to me. You're right here facing <laughs> me, dummy. I'm you got to talk to me. You have no <laughs> choice. You got nowhere to go. Keep talking. I talked a big game about him being a martial artist and Mr. Nice Guy, but the truth down inside is he's a real you know, I mean, he, he, he's fake. So Faber wasn't relevant? No. He was your teammate? He's not. But you've he always been beating him up, right? You've always been I beating up have. all your teammates, huh? Yeah, I've been doing a great job, yeah. You're fake, man. Uh, you're a fake person. You, you pretend to be cool with people, but you're not. And that's why I don't mind talking to you, because you're fake. You're not real, man. You're like Mr. Nice Guy, but it's not real. Can't come soon enough, man. I'm ready to shut this guy's mouth. I think that, uh, you know, his best shot at beating me is to go ahead and drop somebody else out of the corner and keep Dwayne and go up to Colorado and hope that he can have his sensei time up there with, with, with Dwayne over here because if he's got favor anywhere near that corner, he's gonna have a bad night. And that's been proven. I've proven it before. I think Dwayne would agree with me, wouldn't you? <laughs> Where's the little snake? <laughs> and I look at your Instagram, I look at your Twitter and I yeah. can't help but feel bad. I mean, every time you do something, it's the snake emoji pops up. And I, I mean, does it get you at any point? It's not, it's not the greatest, you know? Yeah. So it was a matter of time before that whole thing fell apart because there are just a bunch of meatheads trapped in one room the injuries, the ups and downs, the setbacks. Can you put into words, three days out, what's going through your mind? The goal of this whole process that I've gone through is to evolve because that's the only option I had, was to either sit in sorrows and be sad that I lost some prime years or use them to the best of my ability to become a better man and then see what that gets me at the end of it. Here I am. I'm getting ready to, to put it all to a test and against a good opponent. I have TJ Dillashaw winning the fight. Look, Dominic Cruz has fought once in four years. What he's attempting to do is something we've never seen in this sport. Nobody can take away what I know I've done to prepare for this fight. Nobody can say that I'm not ready and I can't win. I know the amount of work and dedication and sacrifice I've put into this time. Dominic Cruz, TJ Dillashaw. Emotions running very high. Take down. Big takedown for Cruz. First takedown of the fight. Dominic's got his back. Good right hand of the both times. He rocked Cruz. He just got rocked with the right hand. Cruz Good with a left hand. hand. Cruz. Short check hook. Oh, man, that high kick. Thank you, right over there. Tony Weeks scores it, 49, 46, for the winner, by split decision, and new UFC undisputed bantamweight champion of the world, Dominic, the Dominator Cruz. Wow.
There couldn't be any more truth to the words Rogan used when starting the post-fight interview with Cruz. Joe spoke of how Dom had endured an odyssey. He spoke of how Cruz had been tested mentally, tested in his resolve and resilience. Dominic had come back from one of the darkest places an athlete can descend to, everything taken away from him over the course of a gruelling and destructive four years of injuries. Every step forward was met with two backward steps. But he showed us that, after losing everything, it is possible to strive valiantly back to the top. He did so whilst at the same time shutting down another challenger that once hailed from the gym walls of Team Alpha male, another victim of Dom's ruthless culling of the team that seemingly would not leave the division. Along the way he would rake TJ over the coals with some of the most ruthless and sarcastic trash talk this sport has ever seen. TJ even later admitting that it was so infectious it made him fight aggressively and out of character in the initial rounds, something that was most definitely not part of the game plan and something that he ultimately feels contributed to him losing the fight. I remember fighting that fight the whole time, so fucking angry trying to knock him out, that it like threw me off my game. It's a fight. I'm sorry I didn't say kind things all the time. Dominic will certainly go down as one of the greatest trash talkers this sport will ever know, ever sarcastic and ever witty. Nothing hits home like recency bias, and thus, Ilya Taporia, the newly minted featherweight king, finds his place on this list. Ilya entered the UFC an undefeated prospect, with just six fights in the organisation and a seventh unofficial one with a bottle of hand sanitizer and a scouser, Ilya would find himself in the title picture, cementing it with a back and forth barn burner of a win against knockout artist Josh Emmett. But standing in his way of undisputed glory was Alexander the Great Volkanovsky, a man who had held the spot for pound for pound greatest in 2022 and 2023 respectfully, and a man who was undefeated in the weight class. On October 9th, a bout between the pair was confirmed to take place in January of 2024, but just a week later, Volk would be called to step up on just 10 days short notice to face Islam Makachev for the lightweight throne once more. Whilst everyone wanted short notice Volk to be the new mythical fighter, he was sadly destined to fail. He would quickly find himself getting head kicked back down to featherweight by the formidable mountain dweller, and it wasn't a surprise. In a game of inches and such high talent, champions are the last people who should be putting their legacy on the line because they think stepping up on short notice is a badass thing to do. Volkanovsky's openness after his defeat was the writing on the wall for a small group of fans who felt that Alexander's need and desire to get back in the cage as soon as possible was overzealous and probably a mistake. I was struggling a little bit, not fighting, doing my head in, I don't know how, everything's fine, I've got a beautiful family, I think you just need to keep busy. Regardless, the UFC would only push back his fight with Taporia one month, giving him essentially three months to recover from a brutal knockout. This was especially dangerous considering that he would be standing across from a young and hungry opponent, one who was brash and arrogant and more than ready to take everything that belonged to Volk. Despite Ilya having everything fans could dream of, from highlight knockouts to an air of confidence and swagger, he still had his back against the wall going into the fight. Volk was the fan's sweetheart and no opponent would derail that. The way that Ilya carried himself and talked all fight week long was met with resistance at every point, and unsurprisingly, people wanted to see Ilya lose, and the oddmakers had also placed him as an underdog, but all of the naysayers weren't going to change Ilya's personality. I already know what's gonna happen. Just came ready for the retirement. I'm gonna take your head off. I'm yeah, gonna we'll show see, you we'll levels. See, we'll I'm, I'm gonna walk the floor with you. I'm gonna show you I'm the guy you know, that's been on top of this division for so long. He doesn't stand a chance. I'm gonna take a couple of pictures. Yeah, wow. take pictures yeah. now because you won't have it after, so. He took advantage of taking a photo with the belt and that. Uh, Not until I teach you a lesson. Maybe one day you could be a great champion. I'm gonna kick your ass first. You'll learn your lesson. Maybe you can bounce back after that. But till then, get your hands off my belt. La estrategia que voy a traer en la pelea, él no va a ser capaz de resolver. As he had predicted, Ilya would knock out Alexander the Great within just two rounds. 
It was a sombre moment for MMA fans, some suspicions realised as Volk had returned to the cutthroat game too quickly, not giving his chin a chance to heal and recover. The knockout would also continue a curse that has plagued the UFC since records began, those in title fights 35 years and older almost destined to lose. Old man Volk had rather ironically materialised his own joke into reality, the darker truth. The porcelain of Volk's best years had begun to crack, and now that bitter downward trend of back and forth wins and losses has more than likely begun. Although we are yet to find out, we feel it in our bones. Elia, on the other hand, had predicted his eventual crowning moment. Not only had he changed his Instagram bio weeks before stepping into the cage, attempting to manifest this reality, it was also confirmed that during fight week, he had a film crew following him around creating a documentary entitled Road to Becoming Champion. Beyond that, he had also placed the belt around his waist during media day, spitting in the face of superstition. As far as Elia was concerned, the fight was a mere formality. He had already won many months ago, and for what I had mistook as arrogance, a thing which had turned me off of Elia for whatever reason, wasn't. It was just confidence, unbreakable belief in himself to achieve the ultimate goal of any martial artist. By the time his Octagon interview had finished, I was sold. Elia had made that impossible climb to the top, with a story to sell it. And not only that, he was the only underdog of the night to achieve victory. He would create an Instagram post after his victory, with an inspiring message of overcoming doubt. Many will say that you can't do it, they will knock you down and doubt you. But remember, the only one you need to achieve anything is yourself. Trust in yourself, have faith, and work tirelessly, because everything else will come. It doesn't matter where you come from, if you know where you are going. And what's in front of you is much more important than what's behind you. Never, ever give up, just stand up and fight. I think all of us now eagerly await the next exciting chapter in this young undefeated fighter's career, and we also anxiously await Volkanovski's return and pray that he comes back stronger. Coming off a spectacular spinning wheel kick KO at LFA 11, Sean was scouted by the UFC and asked to step up as a fighter on the second season of Dana White's Contender Series. Sean was an extremely self-assured young fighter and despite his looks, was a KO machine. Sean was brash, cocky, and arrogant, and that even translated to the bright lights of the Contender Series cage, where he would go on to produce a walk-off KO. Dana White's eyes would glaze over with shades of green, while Snoop Dogg croaked at the top of his THC-infused lungs. Oh, Everyone in the apex that night knew the deal. The UFC had just found a new star. Welcome to the Sugar Show a flashy striker with sharpshooter precision and a personality to divide, and he was about to take the main stage. Sean would tear his way through four more opponents inside of the UFC Crucible, including a viral one-punch walk-off KO against former WEC bantamweight champion Eddie Wineland. It was that sensational knockout that put the whole weight class on notice. Now ranked 14th, O'Malley's next bout would be against the Ecuadorian Chito Vera, it's just things didn't exactly go his way, getting knocked momentarily unconscious after having a nerve in his leg damaged that led to drop foot, an excuse that would lead to Sean's rather divisive, undefeated mentality. Despite the fact that Sean felt he was undefeated mentally, the record didn't lie, and O'Malley would have to once again prove the doubters wrong by working his way up the division. He would do this over the course of the next three years by taking on everyone the UFC put in front of him, the culmination of which saw him claim a split decision victory against number one ranked Peter Yan in October of 2022, meaning that he had finally earned his title shot. The bantamweight division had entered its Great Depression two years previously, when in March of 2021, Aljamain Sterling would rip the belt from Peter Yan in a dominant one side victory that for some reason broke the internet into outrage. Aljo would back this up by not only repeating the victory over Peter, but also beating a one-armed TJ Dillashaw and barely beating retired former flyweight Henry Cejudo. His less than sensational title run had put a sour taste in a lot of fight fans' mouths, but it was that post-fight with Henry that Aljo would call Sugar to the main stage, ready to bring some much needed hype to the bantamweight division. I, I truly believe and I'm 100% capable of going out there and putting his lights out. I'm, I'm fucking fast right now. I'm sharp right now. I'm accurate right now. I will land this right hand. You go and look at my entire UFC career. How many people I've, whether I finished him in the first round or not, I've dropped a lot of people in the first round. Gentlemen, what does it feel like to lose a fight? Like, what does it feel like to actually lose a fight? Aljo, I'll let you answer that one. I haven't experienced that one yet. Uh, you know, lately I've just been dreaming of cracking his chin and watching him fold. I think uh, Aljo is holding it up. If I had to guess, I don't know. Um, I think Aljo probably is, you know, 
trying to make the most out of being champ because he knows it's not going to last much longer. Fish prediction, the Sugar Show goes out there, puts Aljamain Sterling's lights out. He can go up to 145. Uh, no one will care. He's going to come out like a spaz, try to take me down. I'm going to fucking snipe his chin. Who has this guy fought? Oh. He is going to get exposed on Saturday night. Exposed. He's coming in at number one. Sugar Shot O'Malley knocks out Aljamain. It only takes one mistake, one misjudgment, one misstep, and then you lose everything. Aljamain Sterling would throw an overextended left hand, Sean would capitalise instinctively, and a beautiful punch would leave Aljo face down, ass up. Sugar would then proceed to chuck a happy dad, soaking in the satisfied crowd, and Dana would cream his pants. The UFC weren't playing games with finally getting their superstar to the top of the bantamweight division, and would attempt to capitalise by releasing the knockout immediately for all fans on social media, something that was kind of unprecedented. Aljo would take the loss like a true champ, and has since moved up successfully to featherweight. Sean would cement his place as king of the skinny midgets by outworking Cheeto in a masterclass performance, and finally finally getting that loss back. Sean certainly will go down as one of the greatest bantamweights of this generation, and perhaps of all time if he carries on his winning ways. But standing in his way is one hell of a competitor in Mirab, a man who is seemingly the kryptonite to Sean's style. I'm sure as fight fans, we all eagerly await that matchup. I would just like to say that if you're enjoying this content and would like to see more of this, what would really help is subscribing, liking and commenting. It really allows the algorithm to know that you are enjoying yourself and this is the type of stuff that you want to see on the platform. So anything that you can do is appreciated and really helps the channel grow. Thanks so much for watching. The young Chechen wolf at the age of 19 moved to Sweden, escaping his war-torn homeland. Here he would utilise his incredible wrestling skills honed in Russia to become one of Sweden's top wrestlers, winning many gold medals. This pursuit of athletic greatness didn't come with big paydays though, and so on one lonely night shift, Chemayev would tune in and watch the main event of UFC 194, the night in which Connor slept Aldo within just 13 seconds. The inner voice beckoned, I'm a warrior, I'm a fighter. I have something special inside of me. Shemaev felt that he was destined for greatness, so he quickly joined All Stars Training Center, an MMA gym located in Stockholm, a place where he would train relentlessly. The wolf began honing his MMA skills in a melting pot of talent amidst title challengers and top contenders, his mind laser focused on materializing a dream. After an accomplished amateur career in MMA, Hamzat would turn pro and in the span of just a year and a half would go 6-0, leading to his UFC debut in 2020. But his debut was no ordinary one. He would set the record for the fastest turnaround in the history of the company by winning his debut against John Phillips, submitting him, and then just 10 days later finishing his second opponent, Reese McKee, via strikes, earning him two performances of the night. He was dominant and terrifying, drowning his opponents with pressure, ragdolling them, and then ultimately either beating or submitting them into defeat. It was soon to be reported that Chemayev would make another quick turnaround to face veteran of the sport Gerald Mearshart. Two months later, Dana wanted to capitalise on the frenzy that had begun to grow around this exciting fighter. GM3 was a seasoned veteran of the sport with a record of 36-7 and seven, and had flirted with the top 15 in his long and brutal career. He was a credible threat and wanted to prove to the world that there was levels to this sport. He wanted the Chechen to put respect on his name and not look past him. Chemayev, on the other hand, saw nothing more than a fighter riddled with losses and simply a stepping stone to his own greatness. The confidence in Hamzat was infectious, and the trash talk in the build-up to the fight was either a springboard to even greater popularity or a plummet to the meme-infested graveyard of when trash talk goes wrong. He hasn't met real resistance, and I think that's going to be a, a big test. How many times you lose your fights? Oh, that's quite a few yeah, fights. Blue belt, they're going to choke you out. You, you have to give work. me your back belt to me. If I choke you out, you will finish with this sport. That, but I said to him, you like to talk too much? He said, yeah. I say I'm gonna smash your face, chicken. <laughs> Trying to talk trash to somebody while you're wearing masks yeah, and walking in a different direction. Because I say that, I'm gonna smash your face. 
How are we gonna stop I'm that? I'm sure you think. How are you gonna stop that, hell? I want to beat somebody better than him. Now him, now I'm gonna smash him. I'm better everywhere. I'm better wrestling, I'm better grappling, I'm better like st in striking. How are we gonna stop me? I don't think anyone was expecting Hamzat to knock Gerald out with just one punch. I know I certainly wasn't. All the talk of grappling and submissions was for naught. Gerald slumped unconscious along the cage, and Hamzat cemented his place in stardom with the win. Whilst his career since this has not been the quick turnaround smashing machine that we were all promised, he is certainly still one of the most idolised stars in the sport, and will find himself staring across the octagon against Robert Whittaker very soon. A name hallowed in the regional circuits, and a name often scorned in the bleakness of the Shadow Realm, the Black Dragon. A man who had been snatching the souls of those who dared to dream, 75 and 5 in kickboxing, 5 and 1 in boxing, and undefeated in 11 mixed martial arts fights. To say his entrance into the UFC was anything but highly anticipated would be an understatement. The nationality bender would not disappoint those high expectations placed upon his shoulders, Within one calendar year, Israel had fought five times, four of which garnered performances of the night, from dismantling Marvin Vittori and Brad Tavares in grueling decisions to the first round knockout of Derek Brunson. The MMA world sat back and behold the wondrous, flashy ascension of Stylebender. This path to the top echelon of the sport had not only earned him an interim title shot, but a community of hardcore fans. In Adesanya's interim title fight, he would engage in bloody warfare with an equally willing dance partner in Kelvin Gastelum, who would show that he wasn't about to be written off as a sacrifice to Adesanya's rise. The fight would proceed to be a back and forth barn burner, the two relentlessly assaulted each other, and the judge had it even going into the fifth round. But it was ultimately Adesanya's range, precision, and anime-inspired heart that he would utilise to overwhelm Gastelum, dropping the Mexican-blooded warrior and almost finishing the fight, but ultimately securing the decision victory. This five-round battle had everything a fan could ask for, from shifts in momentum, power strikes, volume, intensity, and tenacity. The Kelvin Gastelum Stylebender fight was a shootout. Best style of fight for me I've ever watched. <sighs> ever. It's one of the best fights of all time. It has to be. It has to be. An even winning fight of the year 2019, with the interim title firmly around his waist. All roads led to the reigning, now disputed champion, Bobby Knuckles. Robert Whittaker was the dark horse of the division, but would cement his place as a true contender by finishing both Bronson and Jacare. The Reaper was undefeated since moving up to middleweight, holding an impressive win streak, which he would cap off with championship belt garnering wins against Cuban lab experiment Yoel Romero. Israel had big words about Robert's recent years fighting in the organisation, he just wasn't as active as champions should be in his eyes. Robert was battling injuries during the two years that Andesanya tore through the division, two years in which he was becoming one of the biggest needle movers in the company. Robert wasn't a shit talker, a stoic guy, looking for a scrap with a cheeky smirk all the way to the octagon doors. Israel, however, was looking to churn out as many one-liners as he could. In his eyes, he was player one, but all that cocky talk was going to look very stupid if he wasn't going to walk away with the victory. I mean, have you seen his Instagram? He doesn't make him, someone else makes him, but hey, he's been talking shit. I mean, look at his last few fights. He's had two fights, five rounds with old Romero gets dropped in his ass every single time. So I see a lot of holes in this game as well. He gets rocked. He does not want to let everyone down. He's in his home country. He doesn't want to let everyone down. I want to recreate what Holly Holm did in this place in 2015. He, he was the interim champ. I don't know when he became the undisputed champ. Am I lying? Exactly, he is the interim champ. You said 10 rounds with your middle. And fucking what? You don't fucking need 10 rounds with a man. If, you're in a, if, you're, if you spent 10 rounds with one man, that's five rounds too long. I'll find the shot and I'll put him away. So there's a difference in caliber of opponents that he's faced and he hasn't been active. I was back there in the nosebleeds, but this time I'm gonna be front of center and making nosebleeds. What do you think about a situation? Honestly, I, I, don't, I don't care. I'm doing my story, this is my journey. Of the 
Back in 2013 at UFC Fight Night 33, Israel sat at the back of the stadium, high above the octagon, sitting in seats that nobody wanted. There he gazed down, witnessing greatness unfold in the octagon. Six years later, Israel would come full circle. I was back there in the nosebleeds, but this time I'm going to be front of center making nosebleeds. But that slick-talking one-liner generating fighter, who so many fans had fallen in love with, was about to start becoming divisive. Eventually he'll crumble like the Twin Towers. See, fight fans are fickle. They drop you as quickly as they pick you up. Sometimes the onus is squarely on the fan, who loves to hate, but sometimes the fighter themselves is partly to blame too. This next story is more of the latter. I want you guys to spend the last portion of this video with me and dissect one of the most interesting storylines of the last decade, which has trash talk squarely in the middle of it. This is when trash talk goes right. Israel Adesanya versus Sean Strickland. Trash talk is often a weapon brandished by competitors to gain advantages, whether that is for publicity or to get over on their opponents psychologically. The next example on this list comes from the perspective of a man who doesn't exactly buy into any of these predefined examples, because Sean Strickland is a man who isn't necessarily talking trash, but rather just saying exactly what he thinks, unfiltered unapologetic, and unconcerned with how it will make people perceive him. As we will come to see, this utter disregard for how people think of him is something that would ultimately lead to him becoming a much-loved and cherished fan favourite. Sean Strickland was little known when he returned to the sport after a brutal motorcycle accident that had left him so injured that many doctors claimed he would never fight again. Even though he was somewhat of a veteran in the UFC, he had never managed to stamp his place in the minds of fans. But despite the odds of his horrific accident, he would find himself coming back to the sport almost two years later. His comeback fight nestled quietly in the prelims of UFC Fight Night 181. His performance inside of the cage was anything but quiet though, talking and screaming at his opponent, the English paratrooper, Jack Marshman, the whole match, all the way to a unanimous decision victory. From there, Sean would string win after win together, working his way slowly up the rankings, ultimately finding himself headlining events against top contenders. And it is here that he would begin to make a name for himself, not for his incredible performances, which there were a plenty, but rather for what he had to say. See, Sean isn't like most people, he says what he wants, and he doesn't give a shit whether you like it or not. Sean was now ranked number 4 in the world, and staring down the barrel of either a title fight against Israel, or a top build number 1 contenders matchup. It's hard to pinpoint exactly where fans started to turn against the stylebender, of course, there are those that never liked him, but mass opinion was always in favour of him. His run up to the title was extraordinary, but his title defences proved to be little less than desirable. Besides a one off spectacular performance against Costa, Izzy was kind of boring. Or so people thought, his Yoel Romero fight being considered one of the worst of all time. Personally, I always enjoyed tuning in, but I'm not everyone, and this sentiment and downward trend of popularity was never more obvious than at UFC 276. Israel was taking on top contender Jared Cannonier, and further down the card, Sean Strickland would be facing Israel's longtime rival, Alex Pereira, in a number one contenders matchup. The pre fight press conference for the fight just highlighted the fact that people wanted a reason to laugh at Izzy, and Sean would be the vessel for it. Oh man, I made the champion mad with his fucking frosted tips and his gay little watch. Oh no! Because trust me, he will sleep you. Hey, no. Izzy, why don't you tell me what not to do? <laughs> tell me what not to do, Izzy. What, what should I do? Take a fucking nap? <laughs> Sean would go on to spend some time in the Shadow Realm, courtesy of Poetan, and Izzy would defend his title against the Killer Gorilla, setting up a highly anticipated grudge match between the Brazilian and the Nigerian at UFC 281. A massive shift in fans' perceptions of Izzy would come in the aftermath of losing to Alex. You can learn a lot about an athlete with how they lose, and Israel fell short massively, making many excuses and never giving credit to Alex. To make matters worse, in their rematch, not only would Izzy say some incredibly cringy things, he also walked out with a dog collar on, which was an interesting choice of wardrobe to say the least, and after the knockout of the year, supposedly against his rival, he proceeded to walk over to his sons, and in petty revenge, repeat what a seven-year-old had done to him almost half a decade ago, mocking a crying teenager as they sobbed at their unconscious father. It was just pathetic, and the internet felt that way also. Whilst I was pretty apathetic about all of it, 
It was safe to say that hardcore fans had started to turn against him. He had just become so unrelatable. But either way, after his fourth fight with Alex, Izzy would need a new dance partner and Sean Strickland would be called in to fill in as the B-side for a showdown to take place in Sydney, Australia. Sean had been stringing win after win together since his back-to-back -back losses and being a company man had quite rightly earned his spot at the top. Around this time, MMA Guru would drop a video that would send the MMA community through a loop. It involved Izzy and his particular proclivities with his dog. The reaction from this video was kind of insane. Twitter, Instagram and YouTube comments exploded into a shit pile onto Izzy and there was no going back. News of this had managed to make its way to Sean and armed with this knowledge, the pre-fight build-up was about to become one of the funniest, cringiest and strange moments of trash talk going right that you'll ever see. I can't show all of it because YouTube has done its thing with almost every single press conference Sean has been in, but here's what I can show you. I'll tell you what, Australians. I am more Australian than f***ing Izzy. Izzy is a Chinese man. Izzy likes sex with dudes. Nothing wrong with that, Izzy. It's a personal preference. I'm sure Smo might be into it. The cringe lord Izzy, bro. As long as Peter doesn't come rush the stage, man. Izzy is China slut. If he was in prison, he would turn you out. He would turn you in. Like, he would sell you out. Like, remember when he got all mad at Dracus because he, Dracus talked about being African? Yeah. You aren't African. You are Chinese. Your words, quote for quote. To bring the belt back to the stage. No more painted nails. No more dog collars. For you guys. Let's go. Puppy man. I had to double check that shit just to make sure it was legit. And it was legit. I followed Izzy for like a quick second just to double check. I'm not jerking my dog off, swearing allegiance to China, shitting on my ex girlfriend. So again, man, people could change. I have repented. God damn, I'm proud of who I am. Are you proud of who you are? I fought him, I watched him fight Kelvin Gaston. Kelvin Gaston, Kelvin Gaston has a lot of CTE. So I need to embrace my inner, inner Kelvin Gaston, my inner, my inner special needs self. Sean Strickland winning the middleweight title is one of the biggest underdog stories this sport has ever known. The knockdown at the end of the first round was as about as a shocking moment you'll ever see in this sport. The story exiting the fight was the fact that it seemed Israel was not present in the fight, as if he couldn't get it going. I believe it was more of what Sean was doing than a failure on Izzy's part to perform, and discrediting Sean considering his most recent performances is a fool's errand. For me, I honestly believe that the trash talk in the build-up toward the fight had seriously affected Israel. If you weren't there for it, well Izzy was booed at every opportunity, chanted down, and his social media comments turned into a vile pit of despair. The fact that he was acknowledging some of these comments by replying, well you can't tell me that Sean and the fan base were not in Izzy's head. As Sean took in his crowning moment, Israel did not congratulate. Instead he stole the moment and told Sean firstly not to cry, but secondly, to not talk about his family, pointing to the tattoo of his dog on his neck. If that's the first place an athlete's mind goes to post defeat, then I don't know what to say. When I made the first video on trash talk going wrong, there was an obvious path to wander down next. And whilst there have been less moments and less examples of trash talk going right, still for me, the ones provided in this video are some of my favourite moments of watching this sport. Dominic Cruz and Michael Bisping will always stand out when it comes to verbal destruction of their future opponents. And while some purists of this sport might suggest it makes us casual for wanting to see the pantomime of trash talk play out in the build-up to fights, I think it's extremely hard to argue that it doesn't make the game more entertaining when it's done right or wrong. I mean, you get what I mean. There is already a lot on the line for these athletes. 50% of their pay, progress up the rankings, a belt, pay-per-view points, pride, prestige and a legacy. All of the above worthy enough in their own right to make a fan tune in. Trash Talk puts something else on the line entirely though, and it's hard to exactly pin down what that is. 
For some, it's to see arrogance be humbled, or their favourite fighter to live up to their words of violence. When trash talk crosses a certain line, it piques our interest. This sport nestled its place in my heart through videos that inspired the one you were watching. Complations of when trash talk goes wrong or right made by war MMA, or the montages of the best pre-fight build-ups made by Lerone. Those were the videos, and those were the moments that captured my attention. Trash talk will forever remain an important aspect of this game. McGregor's meteoric rise to stardom through the viral and emphatic psychological destruction of his opponents, backed up with vicious highlight reel knockouts, created a frenzy that brought in more fans than can ever be appreciated. Us as the casual watchers are surely entertained by the spectacle, but I know that there is a deeper element at play between the two competitors. A psychological war is at foot. The trash talk creates animosity, over-emotion, doubt, all of which degrade performance inside the octagon. Izzy stands as a perfect example of that, distracted all fight week long, not only by Sean, but by those who flooded onto his social media to ridicule him for the way that he treated his dog, his nationality, and all the while content creators reveled in the views gained from discussing a rather controversial and rather strange circumstance. Whilst Izzy's popularity somewhat faltered, it gave Sean that extra helping hand to the engagement beast that he has become online. He is now cherished by many fans, love him or hate him. Personally, I like how honest and upfront he is. He may not say the things that you agree with, but one thing is for certain, you are going to see what he has to say whether you like it or not. The algorithm always wins.